Welcome to the very first Coolcast being streamed live on September 16th, 2001. Um, this is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea, and this is a continuation of discussions that started this past summer under the title of a MOOC cast that was connected to the Edu MOOC uh, that was happening this summer. And it was such an interesting uh, opportunity to connect with people from all over in different uh, aspects of technology. We spent a lot of time talking about well, what is a MOOC and things like that, but um, I, I changed the name largely because I was thinking I want to talk not just about uh, MOOCs and these massive uh, open online course events, but also about how people can bring open online to their own teaching in whatever format. Uh, I suspect we will be discussing uh, the actual title and what uh, collaborative versus collaborative mean. But first, let's meet uh, the people who've joined us so far. And I think we're all in the same order. Uh, so why don't we start with Kate? Can you tell us a little bit about where you are and what you do? Hi, I'm Kate Robbins. I'm in the uh, multi-literacies course uh, for the TESOL certificate on online teaching. Um, TESOL was a midlife career change. I have a master's from the local university with a background in publishing and my husband and I run an um, e-publishing design studio. So my interest is of course most things online but um, online learning but designing for online and designing for um, yes ELLs. Is that the kind of stuff you e-publish? Yes learning modules and um, ebooks and um, that sort of thing. My husband is more computer-based design and I'm bringing in the um, online learning aspect. All right. and so hello design everyone. Ethic. Yes, <laughs> and um, I'm located about uh, 50 miles east of New York City. Okay. So hello. Very nice to virtually meet you. Uh, and next to you is uh, MOOCcast superstar, Lisa Lane. <laughs> I was in one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm north of San Diego. I teach history at Maricosta College in Oceanside, California. And in, back in 2005, we'd been teaching online for a little while, and it had been faculty who had made that happen. And I got the faculty together. Some of them who were teaching online and were very enthusiastic about having the pedagogy come before the technology and, and uh, making sure we were teaching how we wanted to teach in an online environment. And that has turned into a, a professional development project that's just very much homegrown and run on our own. And um, that project just offered its first large scale, I guess, because we've got about 85 people in it now, uh, experience a, a class in teaching online. So the class itself is about teaching online? Yeah, the class itself is, we, we call it pedagogy first, and it's 24 weeks, 12 weeks in fall and 12 weeks in spring, and it's an open experience, and it's about teaching online, and we're taking people through a through a pathway of exploring certain topics each week and readings in a book about teaching online by Cohen Rawson. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool already. All right, look forward to hearing more about that. And next to her is the, the maestro of crazy open online everything, Vance Stevens. Crazy open online learning. You've, you've invented another acronym. Now, can Stephen Downs argue with that one? I don't know. I suspect uh, he can. <laughs> crazy open well what, what can he say I mean it's all pretty crazy <laughs> <laughs> cogent how about cogent coherent cohesive I don't know you know all kinds of C words we can pull out there but uh, yeah I'm Vance Stevens and I'm in Abu Dhabi and in the United Arab Emirates and I'm teaching uh, at the moment uh, an online course for the TESOL principles and practices of online teaching and I think uh, I've managed to uh, get one of our students here. This is uh, Trudy, or also, <laughs> she also goes by her other name as well, but anyway, she, we, we're sort of, she'll, we'll have to get her to talk about her other identity. But I'm kind of interested in what, um, in the pedagogy, you said pedagogy first, um, uh, I'm just, I'm wondering what kind of pedagogy you're using, because I'm, uh, 
oh boy, I mean, I, I feel like I follow a pedagogical model, but it's not really a, um, it's kind of a connectivist one, I suppose, if that's a pedagogical model, but um, I, I was just pulling up things all the time and sticking them in my syllabus and uh, making mistakes occasionally in the syllabus and correcting them, as I just found a couple today. I linked it couple of bad links, but I hope nobody saw them. Nobody complained anyway. But I've said everything straight, but anyway, I'm constantly revising things, and uh, I guess as George puts it, it's uh, chaotic. It can be chaotic. Um, I, it, I'm interested in the role of chaos in learning. Uh, I think that learning evolves from chaos. I mean, I'm talking about sophisticated learners. So I'm not talking about people who are being trained. I, I sort of make a distinction between training and, and teaching. So um, I think that people, and I've actually been uh, just listening today as I'm driving around Abu Dhabi to Dan Pink talk about his four books. He, he did a, um, an interview with uh, Daryl Branson and uh, Tony Richards on the EdTech crew, which is a little Australian podcast, and they did a, just a phenomenal uh, interview with him, and I just uh, tweeted. It's uh, if, you, if you go to Vance S, that's my tweet stream. You can see the link to that interview. Uh, but I was just so impressed because it he's talking really about cognitive surplus and how people want to how people do things because they want to do them, and um, and that basically he's saying that. Um, uh, teachers have no autonomy in the United States. Uh, the uh, the no child gets ahead strategy, or whatever they call it, the no child gets behind. Uh, that um, it, it's it, you know having uh, turning is actually breaking our educational system because uh, teachers and students don't do things because they want to do them. They don't learn how to do things because they want to do them. They do learn to do things because. Uh, you know their, their their autonomy is is being robbed from them, and so uh, Dan's four books apparently I haven't read any of them actually. Uh, talk I did read uh, Nicholas Carr's The Shallows a couple of times, so I'm not really that shallow a person that I don't read the books. I just go to the interviews. <laughs> but uh, I'd really like to read them now, though that I've I've heard a bit more about them. But anyhow, um, and and I too I'm I'm interested in in the pedagogy behind doing this kind of thing. I'm also interested, I'm going to start teaching an online course of computer-assisted language learning uh, next week. I just found out about this last week. Mm -hmm. And right. and thinking, I want to make this an open online thing too for the sake of the students. I think they will benefit from connecting with uh, people elsewhere and it will make the course richer. But it's in an American university, and their syllabus has gotten much more uh, uh, restrictive, and there have to be very clear learning objectives and a primary task, and uh, it has to fit into the uh, systemic requirements of getting credit. And I'm very interested in the convergence of how we can bring this kind of chaotic learning and, and openness and uh, constructivism and connectivism into a context of for credit courses. Uh, so that's what's been on my mind. Uh, Lisa, if you'd like to tell us more about your course and how you're approaching it, I'd love to hear about it. Well, it depends on whether you mean the course that um, I'm running for faculty or my own courses that I run with my students because the pedagogy is a little different with uh, faculty learners than it is with the undergraduates. So I kind of have a different system and a different pedagogy for how I do it. The more open one is with the faculty because I, I feel the expectation is there that if they're taking a class and teaching online they need to be cognizant, cognizant of and ex have some experience in eventually using all of the web as their classroom that that's that's my goal so the way I've set up things for them is a little bit more open a little bit less structured they have more ownership of, of their own uh, means of communication, <laughs> as Steve and I used to talk about, the ownership of the means of communication, they have that. And that's set up very differently from how I set up my uh, classes with my students. Is the course for faculty uh, credit 
type of course or just professional? There's no way to do that. Our project is is so homegrown. We've got no money, no budget, nobody's in charge of us, which was the whole idea. Um, we're completely volunteer, so we're not only tangentially even associated with the college itself, and we're doing our own thing. So we created our own certificate, and it's it's simply a certificate of completion that says you've gone through the entire course of study here. Um, and yet we've got people there from all over the place, from uh, businesses, and I don't know what they plan to do with this certificate um, when they have it, but uh, that is, that's the goal of a lot of them. I think 85% of the people enrolled have declared their intention to stay for the entire year and earn the certificate. So how are you doing it? How are you structuring it <laughs> or not okay. structuring it? And do you have well, any link to toss in the chat room? Oh, sure. Yeah, I can give you the link to the the big bad blog here. Uh, let me put it in. I guess I should put it in both chat rooms. Um, just put it in the EdTech Talk one. Okay. Excuse me while I move to my other screen. <laughs> I don't oh, know how I ever looked without two screens. Chat. Yeah. So I, okay. turned off, I turned I'll off the both. stream. So You should That's be able okay. to turn off the video screen. and audio without losing the text chat. Pedagogy oh, okay. First. I'll have to get back there then. And the reason I do okay. that quick point of geekery is because if we start chatting a lot in the Hangout, we get a lot of little dings in the audio, which oh, true. maybe I should no, be that... a little bit more easygoing about, but I'm not. I can see where, uh, where you're coming from there, Jeff. <laughs> I'm an easygoing guy generally, except when it comes to audio yeah, issues. Yeah, when it comes to audio, yeah. He's got the whole thing, though, really. It's so cool. Now... I'm, I'm so envious of your knowledge. Okay, so this is um, the Pedagogy First uh, website, which is an, a WordPress blog that is aggregated using Feed WordPress, which if you read my blog, you can learn all about the horrors and <laughs> terrible experiences of trying to set this sucker up because I am not an educational technologist. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a coder. I'm a historian. Um, I may be a historian of technology, but my specialty is actually the Middle Ages. So I, I figured it out, and what's happening here is very similar. I'm modeling it on what Alec Kuros does uh, with ECNI 831, which I took, and then I've got a little bit of the Downs and Siemens formula thrown in, and then a little bit of my own experience with creating syllabi and, and learning paths. And so what we've created here is a syllabus um, that you can, you can look at that has set readings for each week and viewings, things people are supposed to view, and a task for something they're supposed to be blogging about. Um, each participant has their own blog, and they're aggregated to here. And that's the basic setup so that people can read everything in one place, although they're learning this week to put together Google bundles and use Google Reader and that kind of thing. This blog provides one location where I can put the, the Digo feed for things they're bookmarking and uh, our own network for the project and that kind of thing. So it's all kind of in one place. They blog in their space that they own. It feeds into here so people can read it. But all the links from the posts and all the links from the blog roll go directly back to their blog and all the commenting takes place there. And I did it that way after talking with Jim Groom because the other course this is modeled on is the DS-106 class where Jim Groom at the University of Mary Washington and Martha Burtis used a aggregated blog like this to bring everything in. And they were really helpful to me in, in getting this going as well. Do you recommend or suggest any particular blog platform? I see a lot of edgy blog blogs. I'm doing that with the a lot of our faculty at Miracosta are very, very new to this. We only just got a WordPress system set up at the college and we're not ready to go prime time yet. We're still playing with WordPress multi-user and there really isn't anybody who's that into this. There's me and one other faculty member. We're just kind of playing with it. So we didn't have any place at the college to send them. So I wanted the easiest possible platform. Most of our people are accustomed to the idea that the college has Blackboard and all courses are supposed to be in Blackboard. And uh, in a lot of ways, the entire program for online teaching is set up to give them alternatives to Blackboard. <laughs> so EduBlogs was simple and it had its own support structure within it 
and it cut down on all the stuff in WordPress that they don't need. So anybody can use anything they want. We've got one person using Posterous and some people using their own WordPress blog and some people just using a feed off of where they're already blogging. But the beginners, I've done tutorials to get them through setting up an edgy blog. And how are you going about uh, the openness component? Certainly there, you, you've got the, the flow out. Um, are there people participating who are not on the ground with you? Oh, most of the people or, in the class are not on the ground with us. I think out of all the, let's see, about 85 participants, I think about uh, 25 are actually associated with Miracosta. And most of them I've never met personally at the college. A lot of them are adjunct or what we call associate faculty. So, yeah, this is this is people from all over the place and they're talking to each other, communicating with each other, commenting on each other's blogs. Because the other thing I did was I took people who had experience and I took people I knew who were interested in taking the class even though they already knew a lot of this stuff and I made them mentors. So each participant in the class has a mentor assigned. This is another idea I stole from Alec Kouros and each one of them, so each mentor has like four or five people they're supposed to be following. So they're commenting on their blogs and, and helping each other out in a slightly more formal way as well as informally talking to each other. And we've got a participant from, we've got people from India and, boy, I don't know where they're all from now, all over the United States, Canada, um, Spain, several, there's a little contingent actually from Spain. Can people and join in still or at any time? They, they, they can. They have to write to me now. We're starting week three tomorrow. So... They've got a whole chapter to read and two big blog posts to do and a lot of commenting to do if they want to catch up. But if people write to me indicating they have any kind of skill level whatsoever or just an extreme interest and they've already looked at the site and they kind of know what's involved, yeah, I'm, I'm still letting them in. I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do with the really, really, really late people who want their posts to appear on the, the blog. There may be a separate blog role. I'm still working on that idea and to try to pull in the feeds from everywhere with the tag. I haven't figured that one out yet either. And Kate and Vance, please jump in with any questions or tangents. Um, what do they have to do to get their certificate? Everything on the syllabus. I mean, they have to do the reading and they have to post every week and they have to be, those posts have to indicate some reflection, but basically it's very much self-directed and self-monitored and they're going to need to create posts that indicate what they've done, sort of self-assessment posts And what if they the just do really lousy work in their posts? Yeah, you sentence. know, we're, we're, working on, we're working on that, and we're hoping that the mentors are going to try to, like people who kind of slack off, that the mentors are going to say, you know, hey, you know, if you want the whole certificate, you kind of got to do the whole thing. But we have done this before in a more closed way. I mean, it wasn't intended to be closed. The blog was, was open, and everybody was authors on everybody were authors on the same blog last time we did this so it, it was open but they didn't have their own space and some people just got to the point where they said I don't have the time to dedicate to this right now some of them formally dropped out some of them um, just didn't get to the end and so they didn't do a final post and so they didn't get a certificate and some of them are starting over now and it was like it, it was no big deal so I'm hoping it'll be no big deal now how long does the course run it's what we did was we made it 12 weeks in the fall semester mm -hmm. and 12 weeks in the spring semester to try to avoid the beginning of semester craziness and the end of semester and holiday craziness. So it's 24 weeks, but it's not 24 weeks in a row. Kate, would you say this is pretty similar to the course that I'm running, except on a smaller scale? It's only four weeks, so uh, well, there's only one assignment really, but it's basically to create an e-portfolio, which means to uh, set your own goals in the course and uh, assess yourself. You know, it's uh, if anybody does it, they pass the course. So I mean, it, it's not really a quality thing. But I think just going through the experience of creating some kind of an e-portfolio for a lot of people is uh, well. I mean, I've had very good feedback on it from previous participants. Um, it's interesting though mm -hmm. because. Um, uh, your structure is very much like Lisa's except for the mentor um, aspect mm -hmm. and mentoring seems to be huge with 
in teaching now in education, they're finding, I think research has found that, that uh, teachers in general, just classroom, are performing better with mentors. But it's interesting, um, I had one question, um, Vance's is the TESOL is um, allowing adult ed certificates through the University of Wisconsin. And I've noticed that a lot of people have been very uncomfortable that we're not using using the um, LMS. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, my back door's open. Just somebody just asked me a question. Hold on, uh, Lance. Did you have any advance? Did you have any problems with getting um, credit by not using the LMS? Oh, maybe I should answer that when she comes back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Can you can you uh, clarify again what? The, there we go. Sorry. What the certificate is, what people are earning by their participation, and what they have to do to earn that. I signed up for this course through the um, national or international organization of TESOL, and this is their um, continuing education, one of their continuing education programs. This is teaching online. And if you complete the certificate of two foundation courses and six um, content courses, you get adult continuing ed certificate credits through the University of Wisconsin. So, uh, Eau Claire, I guess they have some sort of um, agreement partnership. And this is my fourth course, I think, or fifth. <laughs> I've, I've been uh, on the accelerated track um, trying to get, um, which doesn't matter, but um, and this is the only one that is not going through the LMS. And when we sign up for it, you get a posting that from Vance and his um, introductory information, and says we're not going through the learning management system. And then his structure is very much like Lisa. And we're on the first week, but it's been interesting to read all the threads because you see so many professionals um, that are seeking out this course, seeking out. Um, teaching online and struggling because he's not giving them specific assignments and specific structure and he's saying okay now basically I don't know if you've actually articulated this but I tried to in the last online thing is figure out which of these programs that you like and, and follows your sort of intuitive use and begin to use it and then design your portfolio so so it's, is that about the way, are you finding a lot of, for example, there's a doctorate, doctoral study, uh, student candidate, um, and she's really struggling. I think she's finally, from what I read yesterday, I think she's finally caught on that this is not assignments and structure and um, open. Is, is, is that uh, Tuba? Is, this, or is that who you're referring to? I was actually talking about Robin, and then I was reading oh. her um, postures yesterday, and she seems to finally have uh, found an avenue on mm, which she's okay. going to go. Yeah, uh, th th those are really good points. I really appreciate your uh, your bringing all those up. I guess first of all, as far as the LMS is concerned, I I hope that's irrelevant. Uh, I have never I've done this course several times in the past, and it's never come up before. And I think um, it, uh, unless, I mean, you're just making me think, well, maybe there's something, is the LMS reporting scores somehow that I'm not filling in? But that's uh, what's always happened to Sri, Sush Sri Sucha, who, the lady who uh, organi uh, um, yeah, organizes or oversees the program at the TESOL office, just asked me for a list of who passed and who didn't, you know, and usually the people who don't pass are the ones who really just didn't have time, you know, that particular mm -hmm. week or, or four weeks to, uh, you know, to do anything substantial. So, you know, and, and it's a very clear case of who is engaged and who is, just doesn't have time, you know, and, and just can't, you know. So that's not really a problem. Uh, uh, so, so far, I, I, I haven't heard anything about that being a problem. Now, as far as the LMS is concerned, uh, George Siemens and Stephen Downs did, I think, their first MOOC in an LMS, wasn't it? Didn't they use Moodle? And they said that... Yeah, they uh, used it, but just for the discussion, not for the whole course. Yeah, and and George has kind of come to this, well, I mean, he quickly came to a conclusion, but I, I, I suppose I intuitively feel this way, and in that 
the learning management systems kind of put you into a straitjacket, you know, because, and I use them. I, I use them in my, my courses, as, as Lisa says, she has courses for teachers, open-ended, mm -hmm. and you have courses for students, which have to be a little bit more, uh, there you do need, you know, to have some structure, and also the people you're working for want to see that structure, you know. So, um, uh, and there, I, I use the LMS, but I'll, I'll uh, I'll put their assignments there, and they have to turn in assign assignments through the LMS. You know, so it's usually a, a much differently structured kind of learning environment. Um, but I really find that for this kind of course, I'm uh, I like to have the different tools and the different spaces. And I kind of I, I teach scuba diving too, and there's a parallel there, and that is in the in the very first of the scuba diving course, you have to tell everybody everything that's going to keep them alive in the course and they get overwhelmed you know but they don't realize that that once you've got through that that's all you really need to know and so when you're when you're doing the rest of it there's no more overwhelming and I think we've I've sort of settled on some spaces for this particular course uh, one of them is posturous and um, posturous in it, we used to use Ning, which I liked but Ning unfortunately became very unwieldy and so I'm, I'm trying to replace uh, one thing that people were doing in the Ning was doing a lot of blogging. So I don't think Posturus has the same look and feel because tracking so far the the participants uh, blogging themselves. But um, the uh, Posturus is it can be very um, conversational. In fact, I just put a um, a link in the text chat to in, in the other one <laughs> uh, to Joe Dale's blog, which I actually wasn't able to get here, so I couldn't really see if that link was working, but uh, Peggy told me in the in that chat that it was. And so what this, this is apparently, I, I can't see it, but I think this is a post that where he goes on talking a bit about Posturus. And I'm really interested in this platform. I think it has so many really neat affordances. Uh, so, so basically, I'm trying to use this to sort of replace the Ning and to give the, the participants experience in using these tools. And I think that uh, if you run everything through desire to learn, then the students are going, the participants are going to uh, only see desire to learn, they're only going to experience that. And then when they go to put up their own courses to make those leaps, they're not going to be able to do it because there's no desire to learn, you know. They're they're not really the things that they've been modeled are, you know. Maybe they'll have Blackboard, or maybe they'll have something similar. Or maybe they can use a Moodle, but you know what you, I mean, I, I, this course that I just taught, started teaching at um, uh, at one of the institutes here in Abu Dhabi, a writing course. They also didn't give me, they gave me a syllabus, but uh, I I just started setting up spaces. I, I made a wiki space to, to explain the course to the students. I, I set up a posturous blog which they can use in a very similar way. And so, you know, suddenly these tools are starting to click for me. And, um, you know, and I'm using them in my actual uh, uh, student workplaces. But I think, you know, ineffable is a word that uh, I, I actually got from Stephen Downs. Uh, but it means that uh, it's the kind of thing that you can't explain. It has to be experienced. So you, you can set up a course and you can stand at the pulpit and you can explain to people uh, what is uh, you know what they should be doing, but until you actually get them to experience it, get them to, and and the only way you can experience this kind of thing is to use it with each other. So we have to use we have to experience these things with each other, and then things will start to click, and you can say, oh, okay, I can I can set up a course like this. I can use this in my class. You know, so and, and I think that's a key issue is is replicability, and that's one of my big issues with LMSs is, is people don't necessarily have access to that, and they can't take it with them. I mean, that's what I I like about having students use a blog or, and that's been my experience that posters is the easiest uh, they can email their blog post if they mm -hmm. want it's it's pretty friendly with multimedia support i've usually used the google universe i have them blog on blogger and use reader and they've got their photos and they've got you know the whole suite of google tools uh available um uh and largely because i want them to be able to keep their material, whatever they've produced, and, and carry on with it, and to be able to do this kind of thing in their own teaching if they so desire. Um, Lisa, you mentioned in the chat about uh, stats, how the powers that be are very concerned with stats. What were you uh, thinking there? Well, I'm, I'm very concerned with 
uh, learning management systems. I've been working on them for quite a while, trying to figure out what the limitations are, why people like them so much, wh why it's always the default um, to, to use an LMS at a formal educational institution, um, how comfortable faculty are with them. And the only thing that learning management systems do so far that our other op more open systems don't do as well is create statistics, the, uh, tracking, grading, and that kind of thing. And we were talking about administrative oversight in the chat. It makes it possible if you've got one big LMS at your institution for administrators to go in and see what's going on in terms of statistics. Now, if they're going in to look at the learning, you don't need an LMS, obviously. If you're creating an open experience, then everybody can look anyway. But if they're focused on the statistics, they want the learning management system for that. And that, of course, isn't managing learning at all. That's manage managing their administrative job. Um, so that's, what, that's why we were talking about the statistics. But I'm thinking about your class, Jeff, because you've been handed a syllabus, which to me as a college educator is kind of shocking. I mean, we're, we're handed an outline of things that we must do and must cover, but I always see that, and I, I think maybe Vance would agree with me because I get the feeling he sees this the same way. When you're handed something you're supposed to do, the first thing you start thinking of is how to get around it. <laughs> well, know? I, mean, I, I should <laughs> clarify, they didn't give me the, you have to teach these uh, particular objectives, but this is the structure and the structure has gotten much more complex and you can see it's meeting certain criteria and it's all about yeah. someone filling in certain blanks at the end of the semester. Yeah, we get actual, with our American history classes, we get actual outlines of what we're supposed to teach of content from the California State University telling us that if your community college class doesn't cover these 25 things in this chronological order, we won't transfer your class. Um, even there, we find ways to do things that are just a little different and we hit every single thing so going going through it and saying okay here's what I want to do I want to set this up as an open space I want them using Google Universe I want them doing all these things now here's the requirements they gave me you know what language can I use what devices can I insert what methods can I justify to make what I want to happen fit what they insist has How to happen. How do you deal with the artifacts? You know, they want certain products at the end of the semester. Do you have them just repackage what they've done elsewhere, or do you have them produce something separate to meet that? Depends on, depends on what the product is. I mean, in, the, in a college class, the product is basically a, a body of work. If, you're, if you have it in a learning manager, and, and really it isn't even the body of work. Nobody looks at the student's work. It's the damn grade sheet. They, they just want to see that you've assigned a bunch of crap and that a student's got a letter grade for each piece of crap in the, in the system. Um, so as long as I've got my grade book, and my grade book has nice little headings on it that say, you know, uh, chapter test one, uh, everybody's just quite happy with that. But what chapter test one is is kind of up to me. Hello, Sanford. Hello, how are you? Very well, yourself? Oh, I'm not doing too bad. I'm back in my own little hole in the wall. <laughs> how is everybody? Doing okay. We've been talking uh, less about the, the MOOCs and more about how we're trying to include the open online stuff and, and what we're doing. Okay. What are you doing these days? Um, well, still getting people into Blackboard. Um, what is the other one we use? Uh, whatever they use for ramp up my some Pearson product that they have. Um, teaching my statistics course. Uh, I don't know. Basically everything. I'm trying to figure out how to uh, transcribe a bunch of lectures for a deaf student right now with naturally speaking. So fun things, you know. So do you ever try to include the openness thing in Blackboard, or do you have them do stuff outside of Blackboard? Um, we use, uh, I mean, I'm the Blackboard administrator, so I guess I kind of have to make sure that we're using Blackboard. Or um, since I teach the math class, they use the my math lab, my stat lab for all the stuff there, so we use that. Um, but I'm going to be using Google for um, uh, um, office hours if students want it, and... Um, you know, I I use I what tell does that them mean? to use, use Google for office hours. 
uh, Google, I'm going to be using the Google Plus Hangouts here for office hours. I'm going to be doing, like I always tell the students, you know, if they don't have office, go get openoffice.org you know, uh, as a thing, you know, to use. But I mean, they have to do a lot of the stuff with the TI-83, so um, as a statistics class. But I, since I don't use it, I used Excel. I tell them to use Open Office for the spreadsheet analysis. So not a lot of open source stuff in my world just because you know I I've been given things to do it to use and that's you know I have to train people to use them so I I if they come across as something I can find then I'll I'll give it to them and say you know we should be using this but you know since they've already paid for the office and they've already paid for blackboard I'm I'm not going to tell them you know go use moodle uh, just because I then have to learn how to use it to train them in it so <laughs> And, and I have to say, uh, of all these, you know, open cyber hippie webcasts we've done, I think you're the first Blackboard administrator who stopped by. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I saw you. I'm like, I was just looking through my Google. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. They're hanging out. I got to go say hi to them. See, see if it's raining there in, <laughs> in Southeast Asia. <laughs> I'm in Northeast Asia, but. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> it, it's always one big continent. <laughs> Um, so, uh, if people have uh, other stuff to, to bring up, feel free. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the MOOCs that are going on. This is week zero of the Change MOOC, uh, and I know there have been some other MOOCs happening as well. Uh, before we sw segue to that, any other um, threads we want to wrap up? Well, I'd like to just address the, the mentor issue that Kate brought up earlier. Um, she said my course was similar to Lisa's, but uh, except for the mentor, and the people, the course that I'm running with the PPOT only has like four or five people registered, so uh, but I think the mentorship issue is dealt with kind of through, um, well, basically it's a course that attracts a community. For example, Vanessa in the, uh, in the other chat that you've got going has, has been a longtime community member. I think that the, um, um, the Mentors kind of, they're not really mentors uh, as, in so far as they're assigned because you never know who's going to come. But the, the course um, maintains itself as a community, which is really unusual. It's something else that you don't get when you use an LMS because when you use an L LMS, the admins, maybe I don't know, Sanford, you, maybe you can comment on this, but uh, the course kind of disappears. All the, all the chats that you've had before disappears from one uh, rendition of the course to another. I, I suppose you could control that if you want, but basically you lose your community because you've got a new set of students coming in, they get enrolled, and the desire to, to learn is like that. So it's always there's a separation between one running of the course and the other. But the, the way that I've managed this over the past few years is that the community never disappears. It's always there, and there are always about at, at least as many students uh, from the community who come into the course or even people that we just invite because we've got this idea that we, we'll run it as a MOOC, a minuscule online open course, you know, or a cool, I really like that. But um, anyway, they because the community is there, they, they, do, what do you think, Kate? Do you think that, that sort of counts as mentorship? Well, Yes, I think it grab. I think it um, evolves. For example, when we're talking about Robin, um, she just said, "I don't understand Twitter," and so I volunteered to help her work through it. So I think yes, I think the communities sort of find themselves, and that's your point in a in a big way, right? In this, I think in your introductions is that once we decide what it is we're interested in, then we go kind of find those communities and work with one another and I think the mentorship evolves naturally and that that's been my experience as Jeff said it's you know it's experiences and that's been my experience in, pra in past with other communities and uh, also uh, Vance and I both have used Second Life that's my Trudy name and mm -hmm. back when you were required to have that and they actually used to have uh, mentors appointed um, people that would volunteer to do nothing but mentoring but I think in an open course particularly like what we have where we get to choose our own um, avenue and topic for learning 
that the mentorship will change and vary. Somebody might look to somebody for help on Twitter about using the application, whereas you might seek a mentor about the topic that you're working on. So um, I just noticed it was different. And I will ask Lisa, um, you've asked these people to voluntarily uh, commit X amount of hours each semester to be a mentor, or is how, how was your how did you structure that? It's pretty loose. I, I didn't say specific hours. I just sort of asked people if they would mind um, communicating with a, a, a few students as we went along. The main idea was to prevent loneliness. I, I didn't have a formal mentoring structure in place. What I was worried about was that people who are very, very new to this would set up their own blog and then they'd post and nothing would happen. And then they'd post again and nothing would happen. I, I'm experienced myself with loneliness in these very large MOOCs and uh, that was one of the reasons that I appreciated the forums that were set up in Moodle for the CCK classes is because if nobody was commenting on your blog you could at least go there. Well I don't have a forum set up for this class and I wanted to make sure that nobody was going to find blogging to be a lonely experience since of course when we use it in the larger world it's anything but. Um, that was my main thing for the mentors, was just as much time as you can dedicate. This is no big deal. There's only four or five people I'd like you to track if you're able to. And some people said, no, no, I can, I can just do two. And I said, fine. Um, the main idea was just comment on their blogs now and then. Make sure that they know somebody's out there, somebody's reading, somebody's listening. So it's not a time thing. And most of them, I think all but three of the mentors are actually in the class. I mean, they're they're taking it themselves. They're trying to get a certificate themselves. I've only got three people who are just mentoring from the outside. There's something else you mentioned earlier, some long time ago. I, uh, you said that you were having trouble getting the uh, the tagging or the the label. Uh, yeah, what, what did you say about that? I was. I well, went, you, you don't mind. Yeah. Hmm. No, from, from my angle, I, we've got a tag for the class, for and it's used on Twitter as well. Um, some people who want to just be blogging about this occasionally, they're not getting the certificate, they're looking or they're doing their own thing, but a, a, a topic hits them and they want to blog about it. And so I've asked people doing that to use the tag. I, I want to be able to aggregate everything from all over the web of people who use that tag and put it somehow on that main page without pulling their posts into the aggregation because they're not really um, going for the certificate and they're not communicating in a sustained way, but they have something really important to say. So I'm working on that and so far I haven't found a plugin that does that without breaking everything else. Have, have you seen Specify? Do you know Specify? Yes. Yes. Mm, okay. Yeah, and and all, there's a number of other ways to do that. You know, I could do it with the paper uh, Paperly. dot li mm -hmm. thing I could do it. I mean mm -hmm. there's a number of ways I could do it outside the structure of the blog but since I've set up a system where the blog is the front door is the central area where people come I sure would like to be pulling in what everybody else is doing and if they're using the tag that's that's cool you know uh, Technorati used to do that and mm -hmm. what I the MOOCs that are taking place is that Grasshopper does it so Stephen Downs has a script Maybe somebody else knows about this. Uh, yeah, is that something? How can we use this uh, this script, or how can we adapt it to do what Grasshopper does? Because I think isn't that what you want to do? You want to send a Grasshopper out and pull in the the posts like Stephen does? Kind of, except I want to pull it into WordPress. I mean, I want to pull it into what I've already got. I don't have the skills that Stephen has, and I and I know yeah, that. Yeah, there you are. Yeah. Stephen, Maybe he if you're would... listening, please hang out. Grasshopper yeah. question for you. <laughs> yeah, we need an open source or, or a, you know, an easy, a, a, a full, uh, uh, what is it, a, a dummies, a, a grasshopper for dummies. We need, you know, something we can just put our, you, uh, you know, our tag in and, and we can aggregate on that tag. Well, also to an extent, I'm aware that I'm stuck in another system. I mean, I can sit here and diss LMSs all day, but I've put myself in one. Essentially, WordPress is one. I'm, I'm using WordPress as an LMS and you know you can call it whatever you want to but it means I'm stuck with their formats and their platforms and I'm stuck with that just because of my lack of knowledge I'm not a programmer. 
But it, you know, I, I'm also a believer in um, duplication of content. You know, really tagging is essential because once you get a feed, and it can be you know a Google bundle, it can be a, a tag or whatever, you can toss that into a lot of different places. You know, you can toss it into a WordPress, you can toss it into a blog or blog, you can toss it into a, a, a scoop it or whatever. I don't know if you can toss it into a scoop it, um, but I see no problem with multiple. I mean, I think it, I think there is value in having sort of a central hub, uh, but I see no problem in um, alternative venues as well. Uh, speaking of venues, uh, the big one this week is Change. Has anyone been participating in any MOOCs? I know the um, the portfolio MOOC started a month or so ago. Uh, has anyone been tuning into that? There's the big AI MOOC in Stanford, which is a mega MOOC. Uh, and of course, change started this week. Has anyone been mooking at all? Well, yeah, I, I sort of, I have, I haven't really, you know, the the um, the Epcot MOOC has not really been doing things that I felt that I really need to interact personally with the people there. But I'm tracking what they're doing. They're they're doing um, several recorded sessions in Illuminate. Blackboard Collaborate, whatever you want to call it, and they're recording them, and some of them are quite good. And I've listed them on the uh, Learning Together Volunteers Needed page, which is basically our list of upcoming events. So, if you, uh, I can, I'll slap that in the link as soon as I stop talking, uh, in the in the chat, and um, you can see the the sessions that they've recorded. They're doing things. Uh, it's about e-portfolios, so. Uh, a lot of the stuff is why you should keep an e-portfolio, what an e-portfolio looks like. So, you know, um, if that's what our uh, people in our course are doing, that would be worth looking at, you know, um, to see what, what they're talking about and how they're approaching these topics. Um, but a lot of it's about Blogger and about VoiceThread and things like that, which, um, you know, we'll, we'll hear again. I mean, it's, 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 it's not really all something that... that uh, um, you know, but but one thing I, I posted just the other day was I got an idea from uh, um, Zimmerman. I can't remember his first name, uh, Bill Zimmerman, maybe. But anyway, he he does make belief comics, and he just every now and then he posts some of our lists. And I and, and the way he's uh, he's saying that that students can use this to tell stories, and I thought stories, narratives, e-portfolios, and I thought, well, you know, that's cool. What, what about an e-portfolio in cartoon format? And so, uh, I tagged this when I posted it, uh, Epcop Mook, or Epcop, and Carol, Coach Carol, who's running the thing, came back to me and uh, said, yeah, that's a good idea. And she, re she came back in a tweet and said, this is a good idea. I've done one, and she showed me the one she's done for Change Mook. So, I'll put all of those into the chat as I relinquish the mic and stop talking. And uh, but it's kind of kind of cool. So yeah, there's interaction going on, but it's um, you know it's not as intensive as Edumook or uh, for me anyway. I'm just kind of got my ear to that one. I w I signed up for the artificial intelligence MOOC, and then I actually went and read after I'd signed up and found out you have to have had calculus, and then I see all these people <laughs> signing up, and I'm kind of going. Wow, do that many people know calculus? <laughs> or are people just not reading the instructions? Well, that's the nice thing about MOOCs. They're really easy to register for and uh, the follow through. I think that's why you get, you know, maybe 10 minutes of follow through. In. Yeah. Yeah, but my so God, calculus, I am so out. I mean, forget it. I'm not, you know, my my interest level just plummeted at that point. I thought, oh my goodness, so, you know, I'm reading all these books and I'm reading Sherry Turkle and I'm really into the whole artificial intelligence and I'm reading some science fiction. I'm getting all caught up on that, and I really was excited about the class. And then they 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 hit me with the math word. I was like, okay, never mind. I'll just uh, lurk, I guess. Well, we've met all these stats people that uh, have been involved with MOOCs, so maybe some of them can hang out with the AI crowd. Well, I'll need them as interpreters, I guess. Sanford, I assume you are calculus literate? Yes, I'm calculus literate. Um, I haven't taken it in a long time, but I did take the actuary exam at one point and almost passed. So just as a, a thing of my... Yes, yeah, so I, I do do calculus. Uh, I, I, can, I can interpret for you. 
Uh, Have you been well, tuning into AI or other MOOCs? No, 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 no. I haven't been MOOCing. Um, I was really interested in the Edgy MOOC. The engine artificial intelligence just doesn't really do it for me. Um, probably maybe again in the summer, I'll, I'll look to see if there's something happening. But you know, that's. Oh, now that the faculty are back, I, I have less free time. You know, yeah, the to, day job gets in the way. It does. It's amazing. And then you know, then there's the, the night job of taking care of the children. So, you know, they, they, there's very little time left for <laughs> for in enjoyment. <laughs> well, uh, on the topic of MOOCs, I posted the announcement for this cool cast, and and the reason I, I as I discussed in our previous things, I never liked the word MOOC. I just I, I don't like the way. It, sounds on my ear. It's a personal preference thing. I, I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling who might have come up with it. And I also, I, I'm interested in not just these massive open online courses, but what we've talked about tonight or today about how teachers in whatever context can bring the open online to their uh, teaching. Uh, and so I thought we, on their last uh, MOOC cast, we were playing around with acronyms and I kind of like, cool. And so I tossed this up. And Stephen Downs commented that, well, you know, a MOOC does not involve collaboration, it involves cooperation. And they're different because collaboration is more uh, people working toward a particular objective or on a particular task. And so he says, um, uh, if you are talking about collaborative open online learning, you are not discussing MOOCs. Which, to me, I don't understand the desire to to differentiate so much. I mean, I, I understand there's a distinction there and some MOOCs might be more, you know, say, no, this isn't about collaboration, it's about cooperation. But I don't understand why it matters so much to, to draw that distinction. I, I do understand because they're researchers and so many of the people involved in these MOOCs are researchers. And researchers and people who, who do research and write articles and make careers around those are very want to be very specific about the terminology in order to distinguish their work from other people's work. It, it makes perfect sense to me. I just had trouble with it uh, mostly because a lot of the ideas of collaboration do kind of happen anyway, um, even if it's not particularly intentional. And so to those of us, like you said, because your comment said, well, we're just, we're, we're the practitioners. We're just we're just doing it, so the terminology is not quite as crucial to us as what the what the effect is of what we're doing, and I think that's that's really important. But to the researchers, the terminology is is very important. I appreciate that. That clarifies things a lot for me. <laughs> if if you look at uh, Dave Cormier's uh, videos, where he says there are five stages of muktum, and one is the first one is to um, uh, I'm sorry, orient. The second one is to declare. The third one is to um, uh, network. The uh, fourth one is to cluster. And the last one is to focus. And he specifically mentions in those videos that in that, that's a stage where you might find some of the people in your cluster or in your network and then um, collaborate with them. You know, you find out, start getting that project that you're working on together. So, you know, find people to help you with your project. So that's, that's collaboration, not just cooperation. And also in one of your MOOC casts, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, somebody came on. I remember, I was listening to this at, at a bus stop. <laughs> I don't remember which one. It might have been the grad cast. But I think somebody said that uh, they had produced three papers as a result of their collaboration in a MOOC. You remember that? Who, yeah, who was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean that's just collaboration, yeah. So I mean, it just is. It, it may not be the purpose of the MOOC, but it certainly is a collateral result. You know? Well, the other argument was that it's uh, it's not an endeavor that you're engaging in jointly toward a common goal, uh, but uh, it's possible to see the common goal as simply being something larger than the result of a specific collaborative project. I think everybody involved in dealing with open education and in reforming education, I think we all do have a common goal. And we're working collaboratively, collaboratively in the much larger sense. Uh, this is part this morning and what we're doing now is part of that larger collaboration, even if it's not a small group working on a specific goal to achieve a particular thing. I think our overall goal is common, is the same. I concur. As I said in my non-academic, non-researcher way, uh, thin crust, thick crust, deep dish, brick oven, it's all pizza and it's all good. 
Uh, and that's kind of how I feel about uh, all this open online collaboration. You know, there are different flavors, different styles, different terminology that's used, but I think it's a really positive movement in the world of education that people are sharing the materials, they're remixing it, um, and they're figuring out how to do what we do better and more affordably. I mean, I also think that the context that all this is happening in is an economic downturn almost globally, certainly in, in North America and in Europe where budgets are a lot tighter. And I think this has the potential to really thrive in this kind of environment because it could save money. I'd like to think that people's focus isn't on that. I, I would hope, I mean, a lot of this, I feel, needs to be pushed by teachers' desires to be better teachers and people's desire to, to learn more. And I, I know the economic factor comes into it and that that is, that is part of it. But this was rolling before 2008 in a, in a major way. I, I, mean, I agree. I don't think it's the starting point. But, you know, one of the big challenges is selling this to administrations and to people who are hesitant to embrace this kind of thing. And if you can provide some verification of results and say, hey, look, this is how we participated. We spent a lot less money. We didn't use Blackboard or you know, whatever. We didn't have to pay, you know, they didn't have to pay for expensive textbooks. And we had these positive outcomes that we can somehow verify. I feel like that actually takes us a step closer to, to making this more widespread. But how, how do you deal with being seen as opposing a system in which institutions have already invested. I, I mean, at our place, going outside of Blackboard is not seen as a money saver. It's seen as not utilizing the behemoth we paid for. Well, I mean, I can tell you that we're always looking to get out of Blackboard just because of it's a behemoth that we have to pay for. Um, you know, we're, we have a three, just signed a three-year contract and we're right now starting to look for new systems to get into that you know may be cheaper and better and one of them is Canvas. I know mm -hmm. I remember reading somebody somewhere during the edgy MOOC about moving to Canvas and um, you know that was a selling point. You know if you can take your stuff that you already have and move it into another system that's you know half the price <laughs> uh, that that's a benefit and the you know the administration wants that because they're, they're looking to cut places you know that are they're spending you know we spend a hundred thousand dollars a year on blackboard and you know it yes it raises money for the online courses that we run but you know it it, it at some point it, it's too much and you know and and if service isn't there or you can get something that's similar for a lot less you know they're gonna take it you know I mean I have to have my students buy a two hundred dollar textbook because that's the textbook that the the faculty who are in charge of statistics said has to be purchased. Oh, I don't want them to buy that. I, I tell them, you know, I I looked online and said, oh look, at Amazon they have a a, a twelve dollar version of the last edition. I don't think there's a big difference. You know, <laughs> buy it <laughs> if you can. And and they were happy with that because they don't want to spend the two hundred dollars for the book. All right. Well, food for thought. Uh, and uh, this has been a really nice first session. I, you know, if this is open ended. We'll, we'll see where things go. But I, I very much like the idea of people sharing their own experiences and success stories and challenges and uh, maybe even collaborating on projects or. No, we can't have that. <laughs> no, 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 no collaboration. We must uh, move the other way now. <laughs> and, and well, I this. Also... Please. No, sorry. Will this be. Um the same time each week or you may have it posted I might have missed it no we're gonna make it up as we go uh, this is kind of a global sweet spot uh, because with apologies to folks in Hawaii and New Zealand who are not insomniacs almost everyone could be awake for this if they wanted um, really early on the west coast of North America kinda late here in Asia but everyone else there is awake um, but uh, I'm very open to kind of experimenting with different times as well. So the short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> well, do you think do you think you'll be doing it a week from now? Yes, I do. I think the next one will be uh, next Wednesday at this time. Yeah. Okay. 
that's good enough. That's a, that's making it up a week in advance. That's pretty. It's out of character. Yeah, <laughs> planning seriously. <ahead. laughs> um, and so, if if uh, people are listening to this, have you know, if there's stuff they'd like to bring up, topics they'd like to address, uh, please let us know. Otherwise, whoever shows up shows up, and uh, we'll talk about something. Thanks well, for putting Kate this together. Maybe Kate can corral definitely. some uh, some other people from our multiple literacies course for the next one because I think it's kind of fun. So, and and we need an online event. We That'd be great, a, a, and a change will be kicking into gear. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised mm -hmm. we didn't get more uh, changers, but uh, uh, <laughs> perhaps we will. Uh, any before we wrap up, any closing thoughts? Anything to plug? No, I enjoy this. I th I'm I am really um, happy with the Google situation. I've always been a big Google fan and I had just gotten into the Google circles but haven't really looked at it or tried to expand upon it. Not a fan of Facebook. But I've and speaking of online learning, a local friend who um, you know what makes me sad and we can talk about this next time but, but we're all finding this at the transition of uh, people and professors trying to go online and I have a friend that's a very smart professor who wanted to try an online course but with no training and I couldn't even get her to uh, sign up on Skype because she was so she's a philosophy and ethics professor and she really wanted the engagement and I tried so hard to just Skype is the easiest thing to load and start using and um, not encouraged by the university. They have the LMS. This is what you use. She had a really low retention. I'm um, really high, um, really low retention rate, and was very disappointed and had to give D's to some because they were not engaged. And and this sort of being able to sign on via Google, Google Chat or Skype or whatever, it just I think really makes it um, helpful. To bring the res more resistant in and connect them, uh, Vance. What did we use Sunday? I can't, it seems like two weeks ago. <laughs> I've had such a week. Uh, eliminate. Uh, eliminate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We we do that every Sunday at around uh, twelve or thirteen hundred GMT, and uh, next week we're going to sort of seg with the. Uh, second, uh, the SL languages. You'll you'll like that, Kate. You should come for that one. I just managed to kick off my monitor, but here it comes back. Okay, still I'm sure I'm streaming. Okay, but anyway, SL languages is next week. That's starting on Friday, I think, and going through Saturday, maybe Friday, Saturday. Anyway, you can find links to that if you Google them. And two weeks, two weeks, we have something special. Do you remember what it was, Jeff? Two weeks from Sunday. It's Mr. Jeff LeBeau is coming to show us, I think. Is that correct, Jeff? Are you that coming to... That sounds vaguely familiar, yes. Yeah. <laughs> he's coming to show us uh, how he does this. This is going to be a really magic show. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that uh, two weeks from... Uh, and that's now. on Sunday, and, and I, uh, like, uh, 1,500 GMT? Yeah, 1,300, I think he said it before. Okay. Dennis Dukes and set it up. Sunday after that, that's when I'm going to try to get the people in the multi literacies course to show us their e-portfolios. So that one, you know, we'll set up something where it's convenient for people to come online, or also I'll give them the option to record it and just make it set it up at synchronous. Show and tell course. day at multi literacies. Yeah, there you are. It's in the syllabus. I don't know if you've read that. <laughs> Were you aware of it, Kate? <laughs> I figured it was coming at some point. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I <laughs> But you know this is interesting, and I'll, and I'll just say um, this is an uh, an adult continuing ed credit course I've had for um, the last one was teaching multimedia, and the fellow is a professor at a university, and he actually had due dates and grades. The only one in this um, certificate program, most of them been, uh, you know the and facilitator they don't call themselves instructor the facilitator just making sure that you're doing the the work and and checking in and you're trying to do it you know at least showing up like Woody Allen said you're pretty pretty sure to get a, a get a pass but this mm -hmm. guy actually um, graded had the rubrics for each assignment that wow. we that he graded on and I had the feeling that it was his comfort level more than ours 
um, which is this whole transition we're finding with instructors trying to find comfort in the new ways of teaching, not just the learners. And then when you're dealing with adult learners, it's interesting. <laughs> Um, and I, I like that idea of show and tell day, you know, there's something about knowing that you're going to have to show your stuff that uh, improves quality. And I wanted to apologize to our viewers. The live stream went out uh, and now it's back. I don't know why that happened. Also, I'm wondering, did you all, the people who are watching, encounter any ads during this? That's one of the things that reason I'm using live stream, not you stream. Uh, and I wanted to also mention that. Uh, speaking of making things up as we go along, EdTech Weekly, uh, which is going to be doing show number 199 Sunday at, no, it's actually Monday, uh, midnight GMT. Uh, anyway, that window. Uh, we're going to be talking about Google Plus for education. Uh, and so anybody who's out there and a fan of Google Plus or thinking about how they might integrate that into their classrooms, which, you know, I haven't seen a lot. But you wouldn't, I mean, because Google Plus it does such a good job of circles and sharing with who you want to share. I don't know how many people are actually doing stuff yet, uh, but would love to talk about that. Uh, and that's Sunday sometime. Oh, and Lisa, I wanted to ask you, uh, with your course, are there live events? Yeah, we have a, um, I hadn't planned any as part of what I was doing, but then we have one of our mentors, Todd Conaway at Yavapai Community College in Arizona. Um, he is, has been putting together, so far it's been every Friday, but he's I, he's got it set up so he's doing something different every Friday. So last Friday, I guess the first one was, was like this in a Hangout, and then last time was in Illuminate, and next time we're meeting in a Google Doc. Um, to yeah, it, he's doing something different kind of each week, and the place to find out about that um, is actually in Facebook. That seems to be uh, where he hangs out the most. We've got a program, the program for online teaching, which is this faculty organization that I founded. We've got a group in Facebook, and anybody can join. A lot of active conversation is taking place there, um, as well as on the blogs. And he announces what we're doing this Friday and when it's going to be. He's moving the times around sometimes earlier, sometimes later, but uh, that's where to find out what Todd's up to and then we all join him wherever he wherever he is and everybody's welcome for that. That's a great idea, you know, take out the different tools for, for a spin. I'm certainly open, I mean, I'm very happy with Google Hangout, but I'm certainly open to playing with other stuff, although Illuminate, I don't know. Well, we just we did it did it one one time. We want to make sure everybody knows that yeah. it's there. You know, a lot of schools offer it for free or are connected to somewhere where you can use it. But it's like it's so huge. I mean, if you don't have your whole slide deck and all of that, it's no. kind of like massive overkill to meet and illuminate. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we do we do use it. And the painful truth is, it does work fairly well. It does what it does well. I just don't like things that are so expensive. Yeah, me neither. So I, I don't easy. Either. Oh, but web to web it, it's free. You know, I mean, we we because of learning times. You know, they they've right. given it to us. They're paying for it, but they're such nice people. You know, I mean, it's just a yeah. grant. So and the chancellor's can office it. pays for it here. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, California. They use it. You can. If it's not in use, it's available. You know. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all very much, uh, and thanks to everyone who has tuned in. I uh, hope everyone has a great week. We'll be back next week with something. And uh, until then, I guess, be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Jeff. See you later. Yeah. <laughs>